Hey folks, it's Dakota Cohen here. Thanks so much for joining us in another one of our Tuesday night live streams. Uh, before we get started, I want to let you guys know about uh, uh, the new website that we just got up and running here. Um, so please go check that out, buildinghomestead.com. You can find out information about our homestead consulting, our homestead designs, the resources we've got together. Uh, we do hourly consulting. Um, yeah, design packages. We've even got some free resources that I'll be talking about in some of the Q&As tonight, particularly this 25-page uh, Food Forest Key Principles Guide. Um, also, please make sure you subscribe to our newsletter list. That's where you're going to get the opportunity to pre-submit questions for these Tuesday night live streams. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of great questions tonight. Um, we've actually put them into the show notes below. If you want to see what we're going to be covering, we're going to go through them in that order. We've got some questions about, um, we're gonna be starting off with past the solar house design, um, that kind of order of operations, uh, when you're uh, starting to, to implement a property, you know, what, what are the, the top priorities where you wanna start, uh, how to design a food forest for chickens. We're gonna be looking at how to uh, set up um, kind of Working with your parents or or another couple who, if you've got, you know, uh, if you're not on the same page with your vision and values, we've got some questions about chicken breeds, uh, um, the return of small farming, and uh, a few other detailed questions about, you know, food forest prep and stuff like that. So that's kind of the order we're going to go through them in tonight. We'll probably do this for about an hour. Uh, again, please subscribe to our newsletter list on our website. Um, hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel right now. Hit the like button. It really helps our channel to grow uh, and make sure that all this great information gets out to the most amount of people possible. Okay, let's dive into this. We've got a question from uh, our good boy, uh, Steve. He's asking, if you, if you were to build your dream home, what would it look like? What features would it have? Um, Passive solar, et cetera. Okay, so I... Actually, the, your question reminded me of um, a couple of years ago. I was I was you know designing my dream house. I did a bunch of research, and uh, one of the the kind of best resources that I found was this this great little PDF. Um, it's from David Holmgren, um, and you can get it on on his uh, his website. Um, it's called the the Meliodora case study. Let me just pop it up here if I go to the beginning. It's super detailed. Um, it's basically a case study of, of his own. Uh, David Holmgren was one of the founders of Permaculture, along with Bill Mollison. And uh, in my mind, this is probably one of the I don't know, most developed, longest established permaculture properties in the world. This was built back in 2005. He built it in 85, which is just crazy. So it's just a super cool case study. And one of the the key pieces that he touches on is his kind of passive solar house design. And so I want to go through um, just some of the, the key elements that I really like about his design and then also add in a few more of the, the tweaks that I would I would uh, put in myself. I also want to stress, if you're looking for house design principles, the um, designer's manual is also a great resource. Um, and in particular, uh, the, this is the Permaculture Designer's Manual that Bill Mollison wrote. Um, it's great because he breaks it up into uh, different climates, so cold climates, desert climates, um, you know, subtropics, tropics, stuff like that. And for because where you're building your house is going to depend on you know the the style that you're building it in. But <clears throat> you know, in in general, you know, the principles for um, passive solar house design in um, in cold climates here, there's a great little shot here. Oops. Where was it there? There we go. Um, yeah, so in general, in cold climates, you want to really design your eaves and your windows such that in the summer, the the size of your windows and the, the eave or the overhang of your of your house blocks all of the summer sun because you, you don't want that overheating your building. And in the wintertime, when the sun is lower in the sky, you want your windows and your eaves to allow the maximum amount of solar energy into your building to, to heat things up. Um, 
And so whether this is a house or a greenhouse or a chicken coop or a, a workshop, doesn't matter. In the cold climates, this is the, you know, the 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 key principle that you want to uh, work with here is work with your your drastic sun angle changes. You know, in where I live in central Alberta, the sun goes from you know 61 degrees um, on the the summer equinox or summer solstice to 14 degrees on the winter uh, solstice. That's a massive uh, angle change, and that really helps you to basically get your heating and cooling, for the most part, for free if you've got good a few good designs. So that's that's the first thing is really put a lot of of energy into designing your eaves and your window heights. So then coming back to um, uh, David Holmgren's design here, <clears throat> first thing that on my wish list. I would have to have an attached greenhouse of some kind. And in, in my context, this would be uh, probably a, like a, a subtropical greenhouse that I would want to have. I don't eat a lot of, you know, vegetables and, uh, or, or, you know, leafy greens and stuff like that. I eat a lot of root vegetables, mostly a carnivore diet, but I would absolutely love to have, you know, subtropical plants. It's actually great. So the, um, uh, not next week, but the week after, We've got, um, we're going to be doing a, a YouTube live specifically on passive solar greenhouse design with a guy who's from uh, Saskatchewan, which is just as cold and, and, and brutal the climate is, is where I live. But this guy's growing bananas um, in our climate without grow lights and with very little supplemental heat. So I would love in our you know, six months of winter here to be able to have some kind of, a, of an attached space that I could go into that would have you know, dwarf subtropical plants, figs, bananas, um, you know, the odd lettuce and stuff like that. But for the most part, it would just be uh, an amazing place to, to tinker and hang out. So that's the first thing on the south side, some kind of an attached greenhouse. All of my, the places that I, I spend the most amount of time in during the day, the kitchen, the dining room, the living area, the offices, those would all be on the sun side. Um, uh, another piece is a central, he doesn't have it here because they don't, get quite as cold, but a central fireplace would be key. I'd probably put mine, I would swap my kitchen and my dining room, um, probably just to get my uh, my wood fireplace a little bit more central and also have that close to an opening in the greenhouse so that the heat, if I needed to heat my greenhouse in the wintertime, my wood stove could, could pull into there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the other nice thing about that is, and he doesn't have it on his, but I would want to have some kind of a second story or some way that I could have my mechanical room above me. And the reason for that is the I would want to have uh, a thermal siphoning system from my wood stove. And also I would have some kind of a hot water um, solar panel in my greenhouse that would be on, excuse me, the, the low down on the, the wall here. Um, for the same reason, you know, here is that in the summertime, you know, if, if my greenhouse was was essentially, you know, right here in the summertime, I don't need a lot of hot water um, and whatever sun does come in would heat that panel up. But in the wintertime, when it's lower, it would it would really hit that. And if I've had my hot water tank, you know, somewhere up in my either in the attic or on the second story and I had my wood stove, you know, right down here, I'd be able to thermal siphon from my wood stove to my tank, but also from my hot water panel in my greenhouse. Um, and, and both of those systems could share the same, um, tank and I could basically get hot water either for my stove or for my solar panel, uh, year round. And ideally I would have a property where, you know, it would be, I'd have dams or water above me. So I'd have gravity pressure and that way my hot, hot running water at gravity pressure, and that that'd be the big the big piece for me is, is I'd want to design a house that would benefit from having electricity, whether it's solar power or grid tie, but it it would function flawlessly without it. And having that those those two things, a thermal siphoning hot water system and a gravity um, gravity water from some kind of a dam that would was plumbed in year round, would you know that, those are the big things for me. Um, so yeah, the, the greenhouse would help to heat the building um, and it would also help to cool the building if it was designed properly with, with those overhangs in the summertime, getting good airflow coming through. 
Uh, bedrooms, laundry, bathrooms, those are all on the north side or the shady side. Um, the other piece that he doesn't have here that would be really important for me is some kind of a of a mud kitchen or like a mud room or a, or a summer kitchen. Uh, and that's be partly because of, you know, I'm going to have dairy cows on my property. And if I actually go to my design here, so this is my farm. And if you look at uh, so this is this is the current house that I'm in right now. I don't have, I'm going to add a, a greenhouse to the south side of my house in the future. It doesn't have that right now. But what I do have, and I, I absolutely love, is this little attached, um, it was an addition to the house before I bought it. Um, but it's it's not big. It's maybe 10 feet by, you know, 15 feet. But it, it's got my commercial sink in here. It's where all my work clothes are. Um, I'm going to have a commercial fridge in there at some point. This is basically my summer kitchen mudroom. It allows me to, you know, my daily chore path, you know, when I'm milking my cows and stuff, I can bring all my milk back to this room, process it in there. I can make cheese in there. I can can in there. I can do my fermentation in there. But having that attached to the house is just super nice. At Cohen Farm 1, um, we have that, but it's in a... So this is my my parents' house, and then we have an attack like a, a shop right next door, and it's it's close, but it's not attached, and that's where our kind of commercial kitchen is, where we process all of our stuff, and it's it's not bad because it's close, but the at my new place here, having that attached uh, summer kitchen or or mudroom is just gonna it's gonna be so nice uh, for just the amount of, of of food prep that that I'm doing on my property. Uh, so that, that's a really, really big one. And, and there's ways that you could potentially connect those in with the, the greenhouse, you know, like you could, you could extend this out a little bit further and have kind of your mud room as, as part of the greenhouse. doesn't really matter, but the, that's the key piece is I, I want some place to keep my, my dirty farm clothes and, and processed food, um, particularly milk, um, out, outside of the, the, the main kind of clean kitchen. <clears throat> now the other thing that he doesn't have on his property or his his design, and um, so th this is an example of, of his his attached greenhouse. And just yeah, if you could go out, most of his stuff in here looks like it's kind of annuals. This would all be perennials for me for sure. Um, but to be able to go out into a space like this when it's minus forty outside would be absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so yeah, looking at some of his. The way that his ventilation works, you know, having vent ventilation for hot air rises, you know, cool air sinks, and using just properly placed windows for cross drafts, all that stuff is fantastic. the The piece that I want to highlight here is, oops, um, why are you gotta be like that? Uh, I can't draw on this guy. So, is I would want to have uh, a basement underneath my design, whether there's rooms down there or not. Doesn't matter. Um, the, the main thing for having a basement in the house is that's where my my cold room or my uh, for, for, it, be, it would only be cool dry foods, uh, not cool wet. You want cool wet outside of your house, like your your root cellar. This would be more of a larder. That's where I'd be aging cheeses, curing meats, storing you know the my uh, vegetables that like it cool dry, like onions and squash. But the other big piece of that is it would allow me to do an, an thing, something called an earth tube, which is where you bring in, there we go. Um, so yeah, there'd be some kind of a basement, you know, underneath here that uh, like so, that would allow me to have, you know, <clears throat> uh, typically on the north side, on this side here, I would have a, a root cellar, cold room, um, something like that. And then I would have an earth tube that would connect into that and it would go out in daylight somewhere out of a hill and that would bring it would it would preheat air in the summertime or wintertime and it would pre-cool air in the in the summer it would bring that air first into my cold room to help maintain the temperature there then from there i would have it go into my greenhouse to help cool that off and then i'd probably bring it back in as the cold air intake on my stove and in that way i would have just this this passive flow of of air, you know. He's he's got his just with windows and, and dampers. I would add that earth tube in, um, 
and that you can get like a 15 degree temperature change with some of these earth tube technologies, just literally just like a, you know, four to six inch PVC pipe running a hundred to 150 feet in the ground below frost that daylights out. Um, um, and I'm actually doing a modification like that on my current house uh, that I'm leaving at. So this, this uh, spring, as soon as the frost is out of the ground, I'm going to be running an earth tube just like that. Uh, let me draw this guy out here. I'll be running an earth tube. I have a root cellar um, in the, the corner of my basement in this house. There's got a really nice steep slope um, that, that goes down to a valley here. I'm going to bring that earth tube through here into my cold room. Then it's going to eventually go into my, my greenhouse and then back into my wood stove and then out through the chimney. And that chimney effect is going to create a really nice draw. The fireplace will be the, the pump almost for that passive uh, flow, whether the fire is running or not, because even in the summertime, the chimney effect is still going to be in a, uh, still going to be working. Um, and you can kind of see it here in this this image. This is that little mud room as well. Um, and uh, yeah, th those are the those are the big ones. So if you guys want to check out, you know, this this design, you, you can buy it. It's like ten bucks on uh, David Holmgren's website. It's like a hundred and fifty five page uh, case study of his farm. It's his property. It's super valuable. There's tons of insights. Um, here's another great example, just like the cross section of it. Just you can see all the needs and yields connections working here. Uh, you know, this guy just put so much thought and effort into, into his plans. Um, like, you know, the, the bathtub drain comes back <laughs> um, and, and probably goes into the greenhouse into, a, uh, you know, some kind of a, a gray water filtration system. Uh, another documentary that I love is Garbage Warriors, uh, which is Michael Reynolds' uh, documentary on his earth ships. There's a lot of things I don't like about his his earth ships, but there's there's a lot of principles of of how he's using kind of the needs and yields and and passive solar design to create just incredibly um, yeah resilient buildings that that don't uh, you know need a lot of heat or cool during the um, year round. So yeah, that'd be my my kind of big uh, big wish list if I could. Uh, if I could design my dream house and one, one day I'm going to build it. <clears throat> okay. Next question is from Minthia. Uh, she said, you just bought land and the only thing on it is a house. And I'm assuming this is like a hypothetical um, and that you, you didn't just do this. What is your order of operations for setting up a homestead with self-sufficiency as the top priority? Okay. So, um, one of the, the frameworks that I've, uh, I have in my book is I call it the 11 property resources or the order of operations. Um, it's kind of adapted from PA Yeoman's scale of permanence. There's different people have different versions of this. This is mine. Um, but essentially the, there are in my framework, there's 11 categories, geography, climate, water, access, structures, fencing, flora, fauna, business, technology, and soil. And they're arranged hierarchically, not in order of importance, but in order of things that are the hardest to change or that take the longest or take the most amount of energy to change down to things that are the easiest to change and take the least amount of energy to change. And so you know, the reason that I have soil and technology at the bottom of this list <laughs> is because it's actually quite easy to build soil and it's quite fast on a, on a small scale. Um, and it's also really easy and quick to go out and buy a tractor or get a tool or, you know, get solar panels. Like you can really burn through that stuff and it takes a little bit longer to set up a business, um, you know, fauna, flora. So the, the order of operations is you, you want to spend a lot of time choosing the right geography for your goals, choosing the right climate for your goals, because these are really difficult to change. Um, they're pretty much, they're set in stone, kind of no, no pun intended. Um, so I would say, you know, you either need to change your geography to suit your goals or change your goals to suit your geography. I.e. it's easier, easier to move. If you want to grow bananas, and like that's like a big piece for you, you should move to Hawaii or some kind of subtropical uh, tropical climate. You can do it 
even in places like Saskatchewan, but it takes a lot of energy. And so if that's a, a big piece for you, don't do that. Or if you really want to graze animals, don't buy a property that's a swamp. If you really want to, if you really want to do aquaculture, then buy a property that's a swamp. So that's the first piece is you can accomplish so much um, by buying the right piece of land. Like, give me another example. We're working with a client right now. Um, he's actually quite uh, close to my uh, corn farm too. And he pretty much bought the perfect property for his goals. It's like, he's got water flowing through the middle of it. Most of it's treed. He's got some pastures. He's got some good slope. Um, and what's awesome now is that this guy, because it's mostly treed, he can literally go in there in a day with an excavator or a tree mulcher. He can clear out, you know, a little one acre piece where he wants his, his yard site and his, his corrals and stuff like that. And he's done. Like he just needs to build a house now. That's a couple of years. Versus if you really want to have that and you buy a property where that's totally nude of trees, you're 25, 30 years before you have the benefit of shelter belts um, and privacy and all these things. So it's like if you can buy a property that already has that stuff, you can just clear it out. That's huge. So that's just the high level piece. First, buy the right piece of land. Uh, and that's something that my team and I do is we help people buy the right properties. Um, we can do that through our hourly consulting where, you know, you can pick three or four. We can help you clarify your goals, come up with your kind of non-negotiables lists. And then um, you can go out and look, look at properties and we can book calls where we can, you know, pass or fail them. We can then do site visits, all that kind of stuff. Um, but <clears throat> so the next on the list is first thing, water. Like you need to set up your water systems. We've got, um, you know, the everyone thinks that all oh, that I got to put. Uh, gardens in the ground. I got to get fruit trees in the ground because they take, you know, 10, 15 years to, to, you know, for fruit trees to get established. So the sooner I plant, the better. Wrong. It's the sooner you create the conditions for those things to thrive is that the sooner that you're going to get the apples. And by focusing on your water systems first, before you even think about buying trees so that when you do put the trees, you can water them within an hour that they get planted. Your gardens are going to get water. Um, it's, it's so huge. And sure, you can carry five-gallon buckets or you can fill water tanks from, you know, the local water supply store. Or whatever. You can jerry-rig stuff, but it's not fun. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, so really get your water systems, whether that's, you know, your wells or dams or dugouts or, um, you know, we, we previously did a, an entire, I think it was like two hours on this Key Principles water dock. Uh, it's one of the YouTube lives. You can check on it in our, um, uh, on my YouTube channel, in the there's a live tab. I found people have been having a hard time finding the previous lives. They're not in like the regular videos section for some reason. They're you have to click on the live tab. But we did a fantastic um, uh, layout of you know the the different principles, um, the the eight principles of water harvesting from Brad Lancaster. Um, definitely check that out first because that's a big one. So once you got your water in order, then you can start, you know, thinking about structures, then get your fencing in order. Then you might want to start considering, you know, where's where's your garden going to go? Where's your fruit trees going to go? And now you're designing all this stuff out, but when it comes to actually implementing it, um, like most versus most people, what they do is they go out and they buy plants and animals right away uh, because they're concerned about that self-sufficiency piece. And they think, well, the sooner I get a milk cow or chickens or a garden, the sooner I'm going to have food security. Wrong. The sooner you're going to have drudgery and maybe a divorce and a lot of headaches. If if you're in a situation where you don't have that, the best thing you can do is find someone who already does and buy from them. That's the fastest way you can get self-sufficiency. It's probably going to be two to three years um, on your property before you have any meaningful amount of um, self-sufficiency. And even that word, it's funny, Bill Malson, the co-founder of Permaculture, um, hated that word. He 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 said it was never in any of his books. He never used it in any of his courses. It wasn't about self sufficiency for him. It was about uh, community interdependence, basically capitalism. <laughs> um, although he wouldn't have used that word, but it's you want to create, um, you want to specialize in the things that you love and that you're really good at, and that, that your property is is has the unfair advantage to produce, whether that's timber or you know, aquaculture plants or grazing, or maybe it's clay bricks or gravel. Like it doesn't have to be vegetables. It's whatever you and your skill set and your property, wherever they overlap, 
do that, specialize on those things and let other people specialize on other things, um, that's actually the way that we're going to get the most amount of resiliency in these systems. So, um, but once you've got, you know, your, your, your water, you got good roads, you got good, you know, footpaths, you know where everything's going to be designed out. You start putting in your structures, your fencing systems. Then you start thinking about, you know, bigger systems for flora and fauna. Um, and, and then you're, you're looking at, you know, the business technology soil. And again, another one I would say here, that's a really common mistake that a lot of people make is they, they look at their, you know, when they're doing their property diagnosis and they, they, um, they say, you know, oh man, the best soil on the property is right here, you know? And so that's where my garden has to be. And they forget to notice that that's, you know, 200, 300 meters away from where their house is. Um, probably the worst spot on my property is where is where I put my garden. This was literally an old driveway, like it's gravel. And that's where I put my garden in the worst possible spot for where soil is on my property, because you don't put your, so your, your gardens where the best soil is. You make the best soil where your gardens have to go. And my gardens have to be right outside my, um, my back door, or as Bill Molson put it, if you have to get your slippers wet to pick your, you know, morning breakfast, your garden's too far away from your, your front door. So, you know, this is my back door. That's the first raised bed that I put in last year, just to run some experiments. That's where my food forest is. My garden is just on the other side of this house. And again, you can literally see where the old driveway is. Um, it's going to be a bit slow going for the first year, but with cover cropping and compost and, you know, the soil pellets that I was talking about in the last YouTube live with Lee Martino from Terra Preta, doesn't matter. I'm going to, I'm going to build fantastic soil, um, you know, right there, uh, right, right here. <clears throat> Cause that's where it has to go. So I know that that's a, a lot to, um, to think about, but in, in general, again, look at this scale of permanence or the order of operations. Um, buy the right property first because that you can get there 20 years faster if you buy the right property versus and you and, that, and probably get it for cheaper because most people don't value the things that are valuable to you know homesteaders uh, in the current market that's probably going to shift in the next few years as people start to wise up to this um, and then don't even think about plants or animals until you've got this other infrastructure set up and I'm not like on on my on my property uh, I bought it over a year ago last um uh, it's basically a year and a half ago and i still don't have animals uh, i'm gonna get a few chickens this year for for my chicken tractors but i may not have animals even by this year if i don't have the cash flow for it and that's fine because i know from personal experience and working with other clients that it's far better to find another producer who's doing it really great than to to have poor systems that take me all day to do my chores before I'm ready. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I think that'll that'll give you some food for thought on um, on what to think about when you're when you're trying to find the right property, but also when you are trying to develop the right property because it's and the reason I call it the order of operations is you know like in math class there's like the PEDMAS parentheses exponents division multiplication addition subtraction when you're doing algebra. And if you don't do it in that order, you get the wrong answer. And this is the same formula here when you're designing or developing a property is you have to look and diagnose. And these are all the different kind of components of these 11 factors. So there's examples of them in the, the right-hand column here. You got to focus on, you know, diagnose and design and implement those first before you get to these lower ones. And by the time you get down there, these ones are really easy and the soil basically builds itself. Okay, next question. Steve says, uh, what trees, shrubs, and forage would I plant in a food forest designed specifically for chickens to forage in? Um, so Steve, uh, Steve is actually one of the managers for, um, um, actually, I'm going to show it here. This is uh, one of the properties that we designed in, um, in British Columbia last fall. And so Steve is actually going to be the property manager here building this particular design out 
and we've got some you know food forest designs and one of the goals of the client here is they want to they want to really push for grain free chickens um, because they've got health issues understanding that's going to take a few years to to build that out um, but uh, I was just there last week and uh, we were having some great conversations around that so um, yeah to to help build this out first um, there's a resource that I was telling Steve about that I want to share with you guys I don't have this one yet um, uh, forest, but there's actually a book that just came out recently and I, I've seen it on social media. Um, why isn't it popping up? That's funny. Um, but there's literally a book that someone wrote Okay, I can't find it here. Anyways, it, it's somewhere out there. If, if you look it up, it's it's basically something like chicken, uh, how to design a, a food forest for your chicken. So there might be some great resources in there. What I'm going to do tonight, though, is I want to use this as an example to uh, go through kind of as a case study our cold climate uh, food forest uh, document that, again, you can get uh, a free download of this on our website. Uh, it's at the bottom here. Put in your information. You get you get all that. We also did a two-hour webinar with Curtis Stone, and there's also we did like a one-hour Q and A on this already. So there's a ton of content around this. Buildingyourhomestead.com. Go check that out. Um, but one of the the resources in here, and I'm not going to go through all the different principles of you know strata and life cycle and succession and management. If, if those are new to you, go look at, go watch the videos, then come back to this because this is where kind of the rubber hits the road. So um, this is a template that helps to, to pull all of the principles of how to design a food forest um, into, into one place. You can see all the variables and, and start to tweak it. Now you can build a food forest for anything. You can build one for chickens. You can build one for fiber. You can build it for fuel. You could build it for animal forage. Um, you could build it for um, nut trees, timber tree. It doesn't matter. You could there's, you could also use these same principles to design your your annual garden. Um, you could use the same principles to design a pasture system. Doesn't matter. But what I want to do here is is kind of go through and give some examples of some of the species that you might find at these different layers and the different life cycles within a food forest. So first off, in the annual category, um, and basically anything that produces seeds is what you wanna have. So, you know, corn would be great, sorghum, sorghum, sedan grass, sunflowers, hemp. Um, I don't know if sun hemp would do great, but amaranth, quinoa, this one, not so much. Again, this is a, a pre-built template, but you, so emergent, the first year you want the tallest things out there that are producing the most amount of seed grains. Um, you could throw in barley, oats, wheat, millet, uh, borage isn't, wouldn't be that great. Um, your medium layer, absolutely buckwheat, peas, um, climbing beans. Those would all be fantastic for, for chicken seeds, but also the uh, chicken's diet, it should be a third grains, a third greens, and a third grubs. So, you know, it doesn't have to be just seeds or grains. You can also think about, okay, what are some, like chickens love comfrey. They love clover. They love, uh, um, you know, orchard grass. They also love squash. So you, in the low layer, you could grow a ton of squash the first year. You could grow, uh, they love beets. They love, they love lettuce. So th that's the first one is, is think about all the different heights in your food forest the first year. And um, I had a client once in uh, somewhere in the kind of central states, and he literally built a like a, a chicken food forest system where he was growing his, his own grain in his backyard just with, you know, he didn't have a lot of space to get any bigger than this. So he just planted the same things every year, um, but he focused on this annual category. So th that's the first idea is just any anything that chickens like to eat that's fast growing. Um, for the for the first year. Now, as we get a little bit more advanced, this is where I want to um, kind of the nuance uh, um, that I want to focus on, rather than specific species. Later on, is 
you would want to build a, a spreadsheet that laid out the time of year when whatever the crop that the chickens were going to be eating, whether it's the caragama seeds that are popping out or the hawthorn berries that are dropping to the ground or the persimmons or the honey locust or the apples or the you know mulberries, whatever it is, you'd want to map out, okay, when are these things available? When are they dropping? Or, or when can I go out and shake the tree so that they come to the ground? And you want to make sure that you don't have any gaps. Um, so that's that's the big the big piece that you'd want to focus on that would be different in that I don't have kind of a category for that. Um, <clears throat> but then, yeah, the rest of it is just like species that, you know, whatever grows well in your area and pretty much anything with, with berries, fruits, nuts, anything a chicken could get their beak around, they're going to go crazy for. Uh, but I would also focus on species that the chickens are going like, again, it's, it's the grains and greens, but also grubs. So are there any uh, plants that you can, or, or ways you can incorporate um, insects into there, yeah, like mulberry plants, they might attract, you know, certain kind of, of uh, you know, the, they're traditionally used for growing silkworms on. Um, I don't have full grown mulberries yet. So uh, I can't, I can't speak to that, whether there are insects that um, uh, are attracted to them, but I know Saskatoons have a ton of of uh, insects that that attack them, um, or that, that that you know live in the berries. <clears throat> um, other examples for the different heights that you want you want to think about is um, uh, yeah, definitely the. I also think like like smaller apples. Like we planted a lot of really hardy Siberian crab apples in our area. And they actually hold on to their uh, apples late into the winter. And a lot of the wild birds, like we've got grouse, we've got, you know, we had robins this spring even. Uh, and all through the winter, they were eating these, these apples. These, they're very small, like literally the size of a, a small grape. Um, they're not good for anything else. Like they're, they're, they're super sour and bitter. But that's the kind of thing that you can you know, that would have a ton of value for your, your chickens. Um, and again, that's something also because it holds on into the winter, it would help fill that gap really, really well. <clears throat> uh, another example, just, just observations is like the maple, maple trees. Maple trees have those little, you know, seeds that are on, they look like little dragonfly wings and they hold all through the winter. And then the first really good windstorm that you get in the spring that's when the tree releases them because that's when they're the seeds are optimally prepared for or they're have the highest chance of germination because the soil's moist and everything's bare. And this is why maples are such a weedy species, at least in our context. This is manageable maple. Chickens love those. And so that could fulfill your kind of March, April gap. Um, there's another one that I noticed last year. I think it was called uh, Siberian elm and it produces seed in like, it was like August. Um, these like white kind of they're roundish seeds with like paper around them, and um, they, like they, it produced seed. And there was one windstorm in like August or September, and that dropped. And I've never seen like the, the, my yard was just covered with these these seeds. So wherever you are in your your area, like notice the the different kinds of trees that produce seed and the times that the, those seeds are dropping or those berries are dropping. Uh, and then um, and try to map that out so that you that you've got the full year full calendar set up. <clears throat> so that's that's for like your emergence and your high species, the things that the chickens can't like, you know, it's, they're either going to have to fall to the fall to the ground or you have to manually shake them. With the the medium and the low species, this is the chickens can probably pick a lot of these berries themselves. So a lot of things like currants and you know if you wanted to plant, you know. Uh, if you want to plant things like hascaps, you know, anything down here that they can get their, they can actually reach up into the trees, would be fantastic. And, you know, one of my ideas for my food forest on my property is, I also think you could design a food forest in such a way that, um, you know, you've got certain areas that the chickens are, are going to be led into, whether it's with electronetting or permanent fencing, where 
the, you know, say you don't want them picking your currants and, and gooseberries and has caps and stuff before you, you do. But once you get kind of 80% of them and there's just the last few, well, then you let the chickens out and they get the rest because they'll get up there and they'll actually hop up into shorter branches. So, I mean, basically it's like you build a food forest that you love and you could also add in some extra species there to fill in those the calendar year of all of the different forage resources. And I think you'd have a pretty, pretty wicked system that in combination with, you know, the annual species that I was talking about uh, earlier here, the, like with the squash and stuff, I think you'd have a, a wicked system. And also the insects, like finding places to in encourage ants, encouraging, you know, slugs or, um, uh, there's there's insect fly traps that you can build that, that will you know either with light or with smell or with foods you can attract insects into that the chickens can harvest on so all of those things kind of stacked in together and I I do think on a small scale you could get to a system where the majority if not every all of your chickens diet is um, is coming right from uh, right from the property. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Uh, next question is from Amy. She says, any advice for starting a new homestead with parents who have differing values and visions? Also, how should we uh, na navigate deciding who covers which expenses? So I am going to, well, quickly, I'm going to share just the map of Cohen Farm 1. So, uh, this is the 250 acre property that I grew up on. Um, I was born and raised in this house. We subdivided this 11 acres in 2007, um, moved next door to, the, to our home quarter and built from scratch. So there was nothing on this quarter section and I've got other images and videos where I show before and after. There was literally nothing <laughs> on this. It was, it was basically we were full tillage um, cropping system. So I, I know what it's like to, to my point with this is that, yeah, I know what it's like to, to work with your parents um, who you may not have exactly the same vision and values and, and how um, incredibly stressful it can be, but also how wonderful and amazing it can be. So, and this is my parents' house right here. And I lived in a loft above our shop right next door for about 10 years while I was helping to develop this property out. Now my intern and my farmhand lives there. I, we have uh, one one person a year that we hire and train up that basically runs the whole farm. Um, I'm still heavily involved in the property, um, you know, managing things. I still do all the, the meat stuff. So I've got uh, a lot of experience <laughs> with this particular uh, topic. And uh, and it's one that's kind of dear to my heart because it was, uh, it was, it was a real struggle for many years trying to find that balance point. Um, as you said there, Amy. So uh, starting off with is the, there may be, a, I want to stress this, there may be a point where uh, if, if, there's, if there's a large enough gap between your vision and values, you shouldn't do it. Um, my parents and I had almost, almost exactly the same vision and values, and it was still really hard. Um, if if so my parents have been organic since before i was born my mom was a hippie from you know the mountains like she was ba they basically were doing permaculture before it was it, it was a thing um and they were certainly organic before it was a thing so like that's the environment that i grew up in and it was still really challenging to to make decisions and navigate all the stuff so that's the first thing is like if the gap is big enough um don't do it like, like you'll be you'll be better off you know, taking a few years, making some money, um, you know, working on other properties, buying your own piece of land, whatever it is, um, then, then, then struggling through that. If, if it's, if you think it's going to be that far, um, the, the, if you're not on that, the page is that much. If you, if you do think that it's, it's, it's worth it. Um, I would, uh, the, the biggest thing, the biggest change that I found with my parents is, we struck. We stopped trying to run everything like a like a commune, and um, where it was like, oh, don't worry about it. We'll figure that out later. And you no, know, like, just we don't worry about the money stuff. Like all that that idea of just like pushing stuff off and and not having clarity and like, well, we, we don't need to figure out succession or like 
you know, who's going to get the property when we die? And no, like, don't do anything until you have absolute clarity uh, that you should run this. Um, you you should run your business or your your um, engagement like them as if they were complete strangers. And I know that sounds really it seems cold and harsh, but when I stop trying to to not not even just me is my my parents as well. When we stop trying to run things, you know, like a a commune, and we started to run it like the like a free market, uh, basically, you know, all the goods and services go to the highest bidder type capitalism system. It 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 dramatically changed everything, and so, um, th that's the the. It's, it's such a key piece. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. So, you know, I never paid rent for the first few years um, because I was living in the, in the loft um, and um, which is great, but I was also doing a lot of work on the property. And it, then at a certain point it was like, well, who's like, who's sweat, sweat equity, how much is my sweat equity worth? And it was like, yeah, but you're getting free rent. And it was just this disaster. Now it's super clear. It's like, okay, if we were to list, this loft on Airbnb, what's it worth? Like, like if, if you were going to rent this out to a complete stranger, what's the maximum amount that you could get for it? And judging by whatever else is around you. Okay, great. That's what I'm going to pay you for it every month. Now, if you had to hire my labor out, what you, what's that worth on the free market? Great. That's what you're going to pay me. Um, I buy all the, the beef from my parents. Um, so my parents manage the eggs and the, the beef on this farm. What do I pay them for that? Whatever the auction mart is paying is what I pay them. I, I pay them a 20% premium because they're, it's, it's organic and it's super high quality. Um, now, when they buy pork from me, even though we live on the same we live on the same property, my parents still buy half a pig for me. What do they pay? The same price the rest of my customers pay. <laughs> uh, when I buy eggs from them, what, are they, what do I pay? The same price the customers pay. Same thing for the milk. There's a bit of horse trading where it's like they don't pay for milk. My parents make butter. There's a bit of barter there. That's fine. But like, um, what do I pay for rent? You know, because my dairy cows and my pigs use these kind of field 2C and, and field 3B. What do I pay? Market price. And this year, you know, my dad, well, you know, it's, it's we'll call it 60 bucks an acre. It's like, no, it's worth $100 an acre. That's what I'm going to pay you because I, I don't want, um, I, I, you don't want that situation where uh, you're horse trading with horses that haven't been born yet because you can't keep track of that. And, and every few, every month or so we sit down at the table and I kid you not, we used to fight about, you know, five or $10 items. I've sat down with my parents and settled $60,000 debts in 15 minutes. And we have a wonderful meal afterwards. Like that would have been impossible 10 years ago when I started out and I was trying to, you know, run this like we were still a family and everything was going to be free. It, it, and again, it, this, this seems, you know, people, we've got this, this idea that the free market or capitalism is this, is this bad thing and it's cold. I've never had a better relationship with my parents and they've never had a better relationship with me when we just treated each other and, and vowed each other the same way that we would do everything else. So no one's giving favors. There's no obligation. Um, one of my core values is, Mutual consent and mutual benefit. So I don't sacrifice for others and I don't let other people sacrifice for me. So if my parents try to give me a good deal on rent or a good deal on, on um, you know, the beef that they produce, no, that's not fair. And I, and I don't want that um, because, because then there's always going to be that thing of, well, if I, if I didn't do this, I could have done it somewhere else. Um, in the same way, it's like, you know, we've had conversations where, my parents want to know, like, and I tell them, but like, there was a bit of soreness because I was only paying the mark market price for what their beef was, but then I'm selling it. I'm doing the direct marketing. I'm selling it to customers. Well, yeah, you're, you know, you're buying it from us at four dollars a pound. You're selling it for eleven. I said, yeah, but if I wasn't here, what would you be able? To, what would you be able to do with your beef? the only option you'd have would be to take it to the auction and you'd get 20% less than if I was buying it from you and you'd have to deliver them there and deal with all the other BS of the auction mart. And so it doesn't matter how much money I'm making on your beef um, because like, you couldn't do it without me. That's something that I'm bringing to the table. Um, and it's just, it's made it so clean. 
uh, being able to do this is just thinking about what what is every what's everyone's goods and services what are they worth on the free market to complete strangers that's what you pay each other and if you're going to horse trade you got to trade with horses that are that are there and you can both look at them and say yep that's fair we'll we'll do that and keep keep good records um have have agreements don't have like you know lawyer you know legalese contracts but there's a saying it's like verbal agreements aren't worth the paper they're written on um and i kid you not i i I, we we had arguments to the point where I almost walked away from the farm and never spoke to my parents again. They were that bad over some of the the nitty gritty details of like succession and and um, you know feeling like I wasn't being treated fairly. Like it was bad. It was that bad. My shit was packed. I actually did. I left for a, a winter. It was that bad. Um, I came back doing a bunch of thinking and and that's when I started this. Is like no, we're gonna do this like a fair market. Uh, so th that's how I would approach this. And, um, but again, I would only do that if you think that, that you, you have a shared vision and values, because otherwise you're going to be pushing a rock up a hill. Um, and like I said, and make sure you've got a succession plan. Like what happens when they die? Who gets it? Um, I, I got to the point where I was like, I'm, I'm not doing anything else on this property until I know my name's on the title. And they did. And, and because that's what's fair, even though I've got, you know, um, five other brothers and sisters and we've had conversations with them. And so when, you know, I'm buying the property out and what am I paying? I'm paying fair market price. If we were to list this property tomorrow, what's it worth? Probably $2 million. That's what I'm going to pay. And we've got a mortgage agreement, you know, figured out. And if my parents died tomorrow, um, my portion of the the value of the property um, would would be you know paid to me. Whatever I've paid down is is um, would be distributed amongst the the kids, and I now I owe them the mortgage. Like it's it's that simple, um, and it's so that that's that's the key principles. Do things based on mutual consent and mutual benefit, as if you're complete strangers, and you can't go wrong. And and I can I can honestly say. If I hadn't taken that approach, I would I would probably never speak to my parents ever again. Um, instead, now I have two of the most amazing people on this planet um, who we have the same vision with the same values. Um, they're just fantastic teammates. It's it's absolutely wonderful. And um, anyone who's who's who, kn who knows kind of the the shit that we went through over the past ten years would, would you know, knows that I'm not, I'm not speaking lightly when I, when I say this is don't, don't mess this up. Don't lose your parents. Um, because you're, uh, you weren't able to, um, to, to come to that agreement. It's, it's, it's not worth it. You'd be better off to, to leave, let them do their thing. Um, and, um, and keep that relationship rather than stay and have it ruined because you're, you're fighting over which directions to go. <clears throat> okay. On that note, the next question is uh, from Travis. Is, Do you think we'll ever see a return uh, of the small mixed farm? So I think we will. Um, but I think, so yeah, 100% we have to. Uh, we don't have a choice. Uh, but the more interesting part of that conversation is what does that depend upon? And uh, for me, it's, we would not have big farms if we if we didn't have big banking and big government, period. And so the um, it's our current fiat money system and our current, you know, communism on the installment plan type government that we have that has created the just colossal mess of in our current agriculture. The way we're going to get out of that is with the sound money system and basically deregulating everything, moving away from um, democracy and toward, towards more of a, a voluntary system. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited to do more YouTube lives and podcasts in the future. I've got some guests lined up where I want to dig into those principles of voluntarism uh, or basically no government, uh, what that would look like. But absolutely, we, we we can totally do it. It's it's already happening. It's growing. These farms are they're more profitable. They're more beautiful. They're more resilient. They're more regenerative. Um, and uh but but the so the <clears throat> i want to touch a bit on the, the financial piece and um we're launching a, a, a new 
podcast pretty soon here about, um, I've, I've had two guests on talking about Bitcoin and the principles of sound money system um, and uh, or the principles of a sound money system. And uh, I'll just, let, let me give you an example of just why small farms have been destroyed and, and why big egg and, and, you know, why we're cutting down trees and doing all this stuff and, and how that's linked to our money system. So there's something called time preference, which is your, the, everyone discounts their present self or their future self to their present self because like me right now, I'm more certain of that I'm going to be alive tomorrow than I am that I'm going to be alive in 30 years. And so I'm, I'm, my decision-making is always going to be weighted towards, you know, present gratification rather than long-term gain. It's always going to be um, uh, negative um, or, or uh, but to the extent that I'm uncertain about more uncertain about the future the the shorter my time preference is going to be or the higher my time preference is going to be the more i'm going to discount my future self to my present self so practical examples of that in third world countries where there's no stability people will literally slaughter their milk cow or cut down their apple tree so they can have breakfast that morning Right. There's just because they're thinking about such short term gains. And one of the biggest reasons for that is that causes that short term thinking is when there's no ability to save for the future. And that happens for one of two reasons, which is really the one. It, just, it comes down to our governments. So when our governments are unstable and particularly when they devalue our currencies, like in the last four years, you know, 40% of the dollars all in existence have been printed in the last four years. There's zero incentive to think beyond the next few months because inflation is rising at, you know, single or double digits. Just like in Venezuela where, uh, you know, inflation hit 2000%. And we've seen almost a, a doubling in the price of certain goods in the last four or five years. So when people extrapolate that out, even if they're not doing it consciously, they realize there's no point in thinking about the future. There's no point in, planting apple trees or shelter belts or maintaining wetlands or thinking about soil health because I got to pay my bills today. Otherwise the government or the bank is going to take my shit. So there's, it, it breeds the short-term thinking. And, and that is a pure function of, of our governments and their connection to our monetary system. And so the way we're going to fix that is, is not with the central bank digital currencies where they can program you know, the, the right incentives into the money system to help people make good decisions. All you need to do is give people the ability to save for the future in a money, in some kind of format that they know no one is going to print. And, and they will miraculously become more moral, more long-term thinking people. You know, the, the think of the architecture that was built, you know, a few hundred years ago compared to today. Right. We used to build, you know, stone houses. Now we're building shit with like with materials that if it gets wet too soon, it'll just disintegrate. Um, that's a function of our, our short term thinking, which is a byproduct of, of bad government policy linked to our financial policy. So I know that seems unrelated to the homesteading piece and um, and small farms, but it's a massive piece. I can't stress enough and, and I'm, I'm going to be doing a lot of lives and, and podcasts about this topic in the future and why I think Bitcoin in particular, not cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin um, um, as the only cryptocurrency, in my opinion, that has any um, uh, potential to provide that function of a stable money that allows people to save for future generations in a way that no one can can steal it. Um, and I'm super excited about that and the implications that that will have on on just our society and lowering that time preference, getting people to think, you know, in hundreds of years. One of my favorite examples of that is, you know, the the guy who designed um, the Church of Notre Dame, um, his great grandson barely finished it. Like it was 300 years before the design and, and, and completion. That's how long cultures used to think. And it was, you know, even long, there's, there's other projects that took, you know, centuries to, to, to build as well. Um, we don't think like that. And it's because our money's broken. 
<clears throat> okay. Now, getting back to a little bit more of what some people would think is a practical question, although it, it has, <laughs> uh, I think the previous one was, was just as practical. Evelyn's asking, which breeds of chickens do you find do best in the cold Canadian climate as layers? So you want to have, biggest thing, short combs. You don't want the big, long, floppy combs on their head. Uh, uh, our two favorite breeds are uh, Bard Rock, um, Columbia Rock, uh, Red Rock, and um, actually the the kind of, you know, Sex Cell Link or, or the... Rhode Island Reds, kind of the more commercial birds, they're they're quite good too. But the the key thing that we look for in our breeds is that is that short comb, so that it doesn't it doesn't freeze in the winter time. Um, but yeah, uh, the that's basically what we look for. But I'll, don't like I'm the chickens that I'm going to get at my new place this year. Um, I'm going to be getting a whole variety of all the different heritage breeds for the first year, seeing which ones do best, which are the ones that forage the best. So. Don't be afraid to experiment. Um, you know, this is a there's a great article called the four uh, phases of abundance that Bill Mollison wrote, and I've talked about it in previous lives. Where uh, basically it's you want to start out the first year or two is variety trials. Like you want to you want to plant dozens of kinds of garlic, dozens of kinds of carrots, dozens of kinds of potatoes, dozens of kinds of apples and chickens, and everything that you're doing. Plant a dozen different varieties of it or more. And in the first year, half of them are going to die. You know, give them all the same, you know, look after them, obviously, but there's half of them are not going to do well. The other half are going to thrive. And by year two or three, you're down to now two or three varieties that have selected themselves out based on your geography um, and context. And it's great. Another tip that I'll give for genetics is um, notice, and it's not so much with chickens, um, although yeah, it is because like Sussex and and you know uh, Columbia Rock and and uh, stuff like that, but the names of animals are all, all of breeds are almost always associated with the name of a place: Yorkshire, Berkshire, Hereford, Guernsey, Jersey, Galloway, Angus, um, you know Sussex, uh, Dorpshire. Like those are all like that's that's sheep, cows, pigs. Um, Goats, like they're, they're all Dorper. These are all names of places. And so the um, this is the other cool thing it is is like the reason the, those animals, the breeds of these different animals, look so distinct is because they adapted to a particular climate, particular you know context of management, particular diet. Uh, you know, if a pig is raised in a sty versus it's raised in an oak savanna, it's going to evolve very different traits um so that's the first thing is can you find a breed where the name of the breed matches a similar analog climate that you have now the other cool thing is can you make your own breed so i've been breeding pigs for the last 10 years and i almost have you know a farintosh pig and they are phenomenal <laughs> And it's, I haven't been doing really anything special. It's just I've been saving the best animal, you know, raising raising them in a similar environment, keeping the best, eat the rest kind of mentality for 10 years. And now my pigs are like night and day from what I started with. So don't be afraid to do your own genetics and build your own, you know, fill in the blank chicken or pig or cow based on your genetics. Like that's, it's super cool to think. And it's, can be, it's a lot faster than what we think we can do. Um, and in future lives, someone asked me some of the strategies around those genetics pieces. Um, for now, we're uh, we're running a bit late, so I'm going to keep uh, keep on to the next one. Another question from Travis. He says, "How important is community to your own farming operation?" So, there's a couple of directions I could go with this. Um, first of all, I'll answer it kind of face dive what I what I think you mean, um, and then I'll take it a, another direction just to to um, because other people might, it's another, uh, one of the ways that mistakes I think people make about farming is that it has to be dependent upon community. So first, how important is community to your own farming? It's, it's massive. The, the, like it's, <laughs> I often tell people don't buy a property for the property, buy it for the community. Like if you, if you could buy the same piece, the exact same piece of land 
right next door to a community of a hundred people that have the same vision and values as you versus the same property in a community that has the ex exact opposite vision and values as you, like you obviously pick this, the, the other one, but it's, it's community is so massive for quality of life, for, um, you know, the, one of the, the models is the eight forms of capital. Um, and, and which is where, you know, you're looking at what are the resources you own or have access to. And so the more people in your community that have, that share your vision and values that have, you know, different resources that you, that you can exchange with is massive. Again, it's not about self-sufficiency. It's about community interdependence. So the bigger the community that you can depend upon, the more self-sufficient you're going to be ironically. So it's absolutely huge. Uh, now, the flip side of that I want to stress is um, the a lot of people, and myself included, I made uh, I made the mistake of thinking that community or that like they were gonna basically it's like the same kind of communist or or socialist mistake that I made with my parents. I also made it with my community early on. Um, and one of my clients this year, one of his 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 vision and value statements was. You get exactly what you want in this world if you help enough other people get exactly what they want. And I just thought, thought that's a great example of that mutual consent and mutual benefit. The most important thing, and Bill Mawson said this, the most important thing that we can do is to, is to become producers. We need to move away from consumption and become producers. It's, it's massive. And, and so if you specialize in something that you do really well, that's how you build community. Last year, our 250 acre farm uh, grossed over half a million dollars. Um, I'm I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that as a as a um, to illustrate that our farm produced half a million dollars worth of economic value to my community. That's why we have such a good community around us. Period. It's it's not because not just because we're friendly and you know, good people, it's because we provide value to other people and that they are interdependent with us. So don't start a commune, don't do work bees, don't do volunteer stuff, don't pay people for what they're worth. If you're getting free labor, it's worth exactly what you're paying. Um, I made that mistake. I planted this whole six acre food forest with, you know, on a work bee and it was a nightmare. Like I, I, I don't do that anymore. Um, you know, I could get, I could get, uh, I, I, you know, I've, I've, I could have a wait list a mile long of people that would want to volunteer on my farm. I, I, I will never do that ever. I will never take volunteers again. Instead, I found a young guy this year. He's 21 years old. Um, I'm paying him a fantastic wage. He's got a place to live. Um, he's getting paid better than probably any other job he could get. Uh, and I'm not doing that because I'm I'm sacrificing. I'm doing that because I I know that I'm going to get what I pay for, and I picked a fantastic guy. Um, and by the end of the year, he's going to be able to go start his own farm. And so the, it's a it's a bit of a nuanced piece that I, I want to stress. It's like it's same thing with with my parents is 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 I would say for communities. Like don't get into this. Well, I'll sacrifice for them because that's how you build communities. If everyone just sacrifices for everybody else. No, never do that. You never sacrifice for anybody. Pay fair market value. You should be, you should be. Like, what kind of world would we live in when everyone was was trying to pay everybody else higher prices because we valued each other more and more, versus we were, you know, quibbling over, you know, the the price of things, or or worse, forcing the government to impose minimum wage laws, which completely destroys the economy and and you know forces. Um, you know, uh, low skilled labor out of the market and all these different things. Uh, so again, it's, it's a bit of a, of a nuanced piece. Community is absolutely important. It's one of the things that I, the, you know, with our different, you know, the we, we produce, you know, meat, milk, eggs, feed, uh, education. The, the thing that I, um, I get paid for that and we get paid well. The thing that I, I think I value the most is the community connections. Like the the people that I meet who come through our our farm store, it's just phenomenal. The connections I make, um, I would I would honestly continue to do it, even if I was making you know less money, just because of the the value of that. However, it's it's 
why not why not do it for and 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 make money and give people you know a product that's twice as good for half the price that's that's fantastic um so yeah don't think of things in terms of, of capitalism and free markets not in terms of of communism and socialism they they, they don't work there's We've got a hundred years of dozens of examples of failed experiments in pretty much every single iteration that you can imagine of those systems, from you know government levels down to you know you know communes down to family level. They don't work. And um, and ironically, when when people act like traders and businessmen, that's when you really start to build strong community, strong connections, where people would. Uh, you know the, the colleagues that I work with, Chris and Kevin. We would we would we would die for each other, um, and and that's the kind of community that I've I haven't been able to build anywhere else until I stopped. I got over this idea of you know it's all about sacrificing and giving, giving, giving to other people. No, it's about trading mutual consent and mutual benefit to other people. Linda says, I have a 140-year-old healthy white oak tree that I plan to plant, uh, that I plan to plan on planting my food forest beside. Will this be a problem? Absolutely not. Um, so I actually had the same system. So in my, if you can see it or you can't see it, it's blocked there. Where is it? Um I have a bur oak <laughs> that I left in my food forest and I planted my whole food forest around him because um, I really wanted to, to keep him there. So the certain species, it might be a problem, but um, so let's actually talk about one of the principles here is strata. So strata is, is the idea that you're planting things at different heights or planting things that will, will uh, stay at different heights to better maximize photosynthesis and cycle energy. Uh, so in cold climates, we typically want to have 10% of our canopy roughly as emergence, which is the tallest thing out there, which for you right now will be that oak tree. Um, and so what you do is if you start to notice that that oak tree is starting to compete with the things around it, start to prune it, start to get into some of the syntropic pruning strategies like we've talked about in other live streams where you know you're 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 cutting that down you're using the branches for mulch to feed the next system and um and create more space so that air and light um can filter through so there's there's absolutely no issue worst case scenario is you'll have to prune it heavily if it starts to compete um but best case scenario is it's actually going to help provide frost protection provide wind protection uh provide yields that are already there you can throw mushrooms on it uh, probably the biggest one that it's going to add to you is oak trees um, have a tap root, which will uh, typically go down. However tall the tree is, the tap root will be like multiples <laughs> of the height of the tree down. Like I've I've literally transplanted an oak seedling that was this big, like above ground, and the root was like four or five feet long. On a tree that big so if you imagine you know something that's 30 40 feet it probably goes like 100 feet into the ground imagine the minerals and the things the nutrients that that plant is going to bring up to the soil surface and with its leaf drop it, you know a large tree would probably produce you know dozens of pounds of of leaf uh, you know biomass every year even if you're not cutting the branches so absolutely not it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to for, you know for all those different things um and uh and like i i can't really say any other species like i left even all my coniferous i cut out a lot of them but um and you can see here you know before i got here this row of trees you couldn't see through it like there was two or three trees in between every one of these trees so i because of that principle of strata I cut it all out so it's about 10% coverage and I've planted smaller stuff in between so that these guys can act as nurse trees to help get everything established. So it doesn't really matter what kind of tree you're planting or, or that you already have. You can use your existing trees, whether it's a forest or a shelter belt or just a single tree, 
you can use that as a kind of a mother tree to get other trees established around it. Um, and if you start to see signs of competition, just prune it heavier and start cycling that biomass. Um, I don't have great images of, of that, but I've got rows of maples and uh, elm trees here. And I like prune them super heavily. And I'm gonna start coppicing them where like I'm I'm gonna be taking off, uh, where is that? I'm gonna be pollarding, uh, pollarding these, not rather not coppicing them. So right now I've got, you know, these elm trees that are elm and maple trees that are 20 feet tall. Um, as I, if they start to compete with the species I planted in between here, I'm gonna cut them off, you know, six, seven feet off the ground um, and then use all that biomass to, to, as mulch to open up. And, and now this tree isn't competing anymore. It'll, its root, root ball will, pr will slough down to match its size and I can keep cycling it. So um, absolutely not, it's, it's a fantastic resource. Consider yourself lucky to have such a fantastic elder to help nurse those, um, that young food forest and, and show them how it's done. Okay, last question for tonight is Sabrina. What was the tool you used when preparing your food forest rows? Did you previously have sod to remove or was it just bare soil? How much topsoil compost mulch? Okay, so I, I have covered this in, in other uh, lives, but I'll, I'll go over it quickly here. So this is the, the food forest I built at um, my new place here. This was last May. This picture was taken. Um, it was like the first week of May. And then these other ones are probably a month later or so, maybe two months later. But this was an old lawn. Uh, and the only thing I did to it is I rototilled the rows. I, there's a case study down here at the bottom. Again, this document, you can go to buildingyourhomestead.com and get a free download of it here on our website. Um, Put information at the bottom here, you'll get this case study. So I, I rototilled my rows. I used it because it was quite compacted. I did subsoil, um, which is just deep ripping to allow roots and oxygen and water to get deeper into the soil. I did add amendments to these beds, um, uh, which was in the form of those soil pellets that we talked about in our last YouTube live with, with Lee Martin. No, you could add compost, you could, you could add you know, chicken manure, all kinds of stuff, but definitely I did amend my my uh, strips. I just used a four foot rotor tiller uh, behind my little tractor. You could use a smaller rotor tiller. You could use a walk behind. If it was a small enough system, you could you could um, use uh, you know hand tillage systems. Um, but for me, I did use a four foot rotor tiller. Amended the soil, um, deep ripped. Then I planted, and then I planted a ton of cover crops so you know there's a tree every foot these are 50 foot beds there's a tree every foot i've got strawberries asparagus um, comfrey jerusalem artichoke the um, and this is what it looks this is this picture was taken a f like a few months later after planting um, i had this particular tree here you can see it was i planted it at a foot and it was over four feet tall by the end of the summer. Uh, this is an Okanese poplar. Uh, you know, the comfrey, I got two cuttings out of my comfrey and Jerusalem artichoke. I got three cuttings out of my cover crop, which was um, the just pretty a, a standard. Well, you can look at see what the species that I planted here in this in this chart. A lot of them were this these species here, things like barley, oat, wheats. Um, you know, kale, turnips, radishes, uh, sunflowers, all that stuff. A lot of these species are what I what I planted in my system. And uh, that's really what is, is going to build this, this soil system long term. So the, the mending of, of the soil that I did, uh, I, I did some tillage to, to knock the weeds back or the, the grass back so I could get the species I wanted established, put a ton of biomass and, and plants into the ground. And uh, already this soil is just it's fantastic. I'll be doing some videos, uh, YouTube videos, of kind of going into a bit more depth and, you know, while I'm out there in the system as you're managing it to show some of those systems. But, um, yeah, that's, that's the general principle of that. 
and and one of the things I've talked about in other lives is the principle three was of succession. You have to understand where your soil is, uh, or not, not just your soil, your ecosystem is on this successional cycle. If it's in an establishment phase, you can't plant full size apple trees and you know the big potted plant. They're not going to do well. Um, you you really need to build. You need to accumulate um, natural capital and be in this kind of transitory phase before you can get into this abundance phase. And so you may not plant fruit trees for the first year or two. You know, for me on my, um, can you see it here? On the new food forest that I'm planting this year, you can kind of see it here. I um, uh, So this was a, you know, five 50 foot rows. This is like three, you know, 200 foot rows that I'm planting this year. And I put a cover crop in last year because I'm trying to build the soil slower because uh, it's a bit bigger area and uh, to plant and I want to give it a, a, a better chance. So that would be the ideal system is if you did all that same stuff the year before and just planted a cover crop, let it grow for a year, mow it and um, cycle the nutrients. Then in the next following year or maybe two years, then till it again, get your bed, um, you know, uh, bed prep so it's easy to plant all your trees in, and uh, and you'll actually get. Ironically, you'll get there faster than if you just planted things right away. So you know, I've planted thousands of trees in my life, and by spending, you know, putting investing the right amount into my natural capital, the and getting that, you know three plus feet of growth off of one of these trees. I've never even come close to that in any of the plant things that I've done. And so, you know, like this tree grew three times faster than anything else I've ever, ever grown because I put the effort into getting it right. And so if it, even if it took you three years to, to prepare the site, then you planted the tree, you'd, you'd be better off than if you planted this thing into bad soil, you didn't have the management, you didn't have the water, you didn't have the fencing right so that to keep, you know, whatever animals or deer out of it. Um, you know, going back to that order of operations we talked about earlier, flora and fauna is way down here. There's a lot of other stuff um, you need to be thinking about before you get to that stage. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I think that does it, folks. So, with that, we will close out here again thank you guys so much for submitting your questions um the we didn't get a chance to get into questions in the live tonight or in the, the youtube live if you want your questions answered um please do subscribe to our newsletter list you can pre-submit them like these folks did tonight or you can put up a um a super chat and uh throw a bit of money at us and we'll, we'll happily answer your question you can also go to uh, buildingyourhomestead.com where you can check out our different design services where we help homesteaders all around the world join the revolution that's disguised as homesteading. We do hourly consulting, homestead design packages, um, and help people get set up with the, you know, the right tools if they're going to do it themselves. You can find all those resources on our website. Links are going to show up below. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. And next week, we are going to be doing a YouTube live with the wonderful uh malcolm from the light cellar in calgary he's gonna be doing a presentation on kind of homesteading medicinal gardens and and um, herbal medicine so make sure you tune into that all right folks have a good night we'll talk to you later